You're asking me hard questions, Terry. Because I, you know, because I don't know, you know. I don't necessarily know how this all works. It starts with an idea, and, and if you can get somebody to buy into the idea and add value, and they get recognized for the value that they add, it's a place that they want to stay. My first day. Yeah, my first day, I was like, wow, this is something else. Oh, I thought everybody was drinking the Kool-Aid over here. <laughs> I was like, why is everybody all happy? Like, like a family member has been my boss pretty much the nine and a half years I've been here. It's just a kick-ass place to work. Um, I enjoy going to work. I'm going to miss going to work. Yeah. Yeah. This is Tazo Tea Company at 301 Southeast 2nd Avenue in Portland, Oregon. And this is us, the Tazos. The year is 2012. We're about to embark on what turned out to be our final project. After 18 years as a Portland icon, we're closing the doors on Tazo Portland forever. Before going our separate ways, a few of us got hold of a video camera and began interviewing our co-workers as they faced their final days. Boom. We may not have known exactly what we were doing, but in true Tazo form, we jumped right in and got to work figuring it out. <laughs> Little did we know we were embarking on a three-year quest to discover the secrets of what made Tazo so much more than just a place to work. タゾ。People say, wow, Tazo is such an amazing place. You know, how, how have you created that culture there? And do you guys actually do, do any work there? Because it sounds like, you know, you, you go to yoga and, and then you have a tea tasting and then there's like a birthday party. And the next day we had a huge party. Bake sales and cook-offs and barbecues. And, and the next day we had a company meeting, which was kind of like a party. Vegetable bowling in the warehouse. Vegetable bowling in the warehouse. Yeah, bocce tournaments. I wasn't sure what y'all needed me for at first because it seemed like you were doing a lot of partying. <laughs> you know, we shot basketball hoop at lunch. We hung out in the evenings and, uh, you know, had a beer after work and it kind of gave this whole, like, cheers kind of feeling almost. We came into work to hang out with the people that were important to us and, um, and to do a great job. We're not just here for a paycheck. We're here for the whole thing. Yeah. To discover what made this come to be, we'd better start at the beginning. It all started with a guy named Steve. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. He's the most intensely creative person I've ever worked with, without question. So passionate. I mean, I think that that is the one word I would use to describe him. Um, a perfectionist about tea and about every single thing that went into Tazo. And if it wasn't true to Tazo, he wasn't having it. The beauty of Steve was always that um, no matter what he had on his plate, he would always make time if you needed time with him. And um, he was eager to teach you. We're all going to be great. This product is going to be great. And I think Steve believed that in everybody. And he demanded it from everybody, whether they want to do it or not. And I think in other companies, you, you don't get that. You, you, you put the resources towards the folks that you know are going to excel and, and who are on your level. But Steve wanted everybody to understand a certain amount of his perspective. I have a real passion for the things that I do. And, and beginning with um, with an idea that we could make a difference in in the world of tea with this little brand called Tazo. He had an idea to take the highest quality tea possible and blend it 
with a bit of magic. In 94, he brought his idea to, well, some other guy's name, Steve. 21 years ago, in this room, where you're sitting, <laughs> he was sitting where you're sitting. I was sitting to your right, and Steve Lee and Steve Sandoz were sitting to your left. This perfect blend, this meeting of the minds, well, this meeting of the Steves, started something that, with the right ingredients and a little time to steep, would revolutionize tea. Well, I wanted to create our own culture, and I thought that it was time to, um, to sort of draw on the cultures of other tea-consuming countries. The sort of working directive was Marco Polo meets Merlin. That was a brief, <laughs> basically, <laughs> a one-sentence brief. Steve Sandoz had spent a year of his life working, traveling, basically as a minstrel singing in, in little restaurants and cafes in India. That experience gave him actual places to refer to in the copy. When he was making the stories up, he could pinpoint where that was, the path to Muktanath. I think he bought a, a book called The History of the World, and then he would rewrite history to reflect Tazo. How many offices or companies you sit in when the person sitting next to you is taking calls from customers. Is this real? Are these stories real? And she'd have little scripted answers. Yes, they can be if you want, you know. <laughs> just, just fun. People love that. It's amazing. Yeah. And people did love it. The Tazo mystique extended to customers. They appreciated being in its culture as much as they appreciated the tea. Lots of people were looking at Tazo and saying, this is a brand, this is a way you build it. There is no personal agenda here. This is an idea, and this idea belongs to this brand that we're making. What we had is we just had the opportunity with this, with this brand that was being created to, um, it just kept opening up for us like a flower, you know? Steve Smith had planted the seed for that flower. The brand and culture were thriving, but what the business needed was an expert gardener. He came in about a year after the company was founded and um, brought a lot of structure to the, to the company. They needed capital, and I was able to raise, it wasn't a lot, but it was enough capital for a tea company. So that's why you got the job, more or less. Maybe. I, and I was willing to do it really cheap, yeah. I was 32, hadn't run anything other than a Kool-Aid stand in my life, and you know, that was in partnership with my brother. Great and gifted as Steve was at, at T, Tal is probably just as great and just as gifted at, at running business. I don't think Tazo could have existed without both of them together. I learned a lot from Tal, and that the things that, that I think we both learned was that, that um, and Tal may say this too, is that, is that I learned that he was more creative than I thought he would be, and he learned that I had um, more business sense than he thought I had. Yin and yang. Yin and yang. Yeah. Steve and Tal knew both their own and each other's strengths. Their mutual respect set the example, and that empowered us to rise to any challenge they gave us, which would prove essential if the company was going to grow. When you're a small company, you reach these plateaus, and sometimes those plateaus are, are things like, um, well, we have plenty of orders, well, we don't have enough money to buy the raw materials to fulfill the order. 
in fact, there was a clock ticking that said someday there's going to be a liquidity event in this business and it's going to be sold. The only question was when and to whom. Howard called and said, guess what I'm eating right now? And I said, I don't know. What are you eating? He said, I'm having one of your chai bars. It's really good. He said, I didn't know you were in the business. I said, oh, come on. You know I'm in the business, you know. So, so as we were looking at, we needed this strategic partner. Hot tea, tea and tea bags, tea and sachets, it's kind of a patient business in a, in a way. Once you get in, if you're you know, in a restaurant or something, you stick for a while. Tea and bottles, not a patient business. You, know, you, need, you need capital to, to be able to grow that business. So we talked to a couple different juice manufacturers. We talked to Celestial Seasonings. They came out and kicked the tires. And then Tal said, what, what, do you, what do you say we talk to Starbucks? Sometime prior to that meeting, um, we had heard that Starbucks was going to come out with a product called Tea Aussie Tea, which was juice tea, which was we were the only ones doing anything with juice tea. We, I think, were the first ones to do things with juice tea with the company's first product line. And I remember uh, that uh, we sued Starbucks to cease and desist with that. You know, this little 23-person tea company is going to get really mad. It wasn't too long after that that uh, we found out, hey, um, we're going to be acquired by Starbucks. They had 23,000 employees. We had 23 employees, and our, we wanted to keep a 1 to 1,000 ratio as we grew and they grew, and we actually, I think, kind of did, which was weird. That's when the rocket ride really started. There were 30 of us or so, and we're trying to put tea into, you know, whatever, five, six, seven thousand Starbucks stores. We were incredibly efficient when I, I think of other places that I work and what it takes to get things done. It's sort of the same vibe you get in a good, in a good kitchen, where it's like you have one station working with another station. You know, it's all just teamwork. Everybody's working together, and we make, we make our deadline over here. You know, there are times where it's all hands on deck, and, you know, you'll see uh, anybody out there stacking cases or blending tea. And yeah, the thing at Tazo is that um, nobody was better than anybody else, ever. And if anybody in one department needed help, we always tried to find a way to make that happen. Nobody ever said, that's not my job. I think people saw a culture where you could um, bring up ideas and suggestions, no matter where you were in the company, whether you were driving a forklift, whether you were, you know, management or QA, and your idea, no matter what it was, could come to fruition and make the whole thing better. One thing that happens when you work for visionary leaders, you discover the visions are not always easily implemented in the real world. Tazo gave people the opportunity to make mistakes. You weren't kicked out the door when you made a mistake. It was an opportunity to grow. When we launched our spicy Tazo chai into Starbucks, we ended up with the most customer complaints of any new product launch ever. All 30 Tazos rallied to reformulate and deliver a new chai to 3,000 stores. This new chai was so delicious it became one of the most popular beverages at Starbucks. You listen to all these motivational speakers and they say, oh, don't be afraid to fail. But in so many businesses, if you fail, they still hit you with a stick. In a company growing 30 to 50% per year, our leaders were smart enough to know that things weren't always going to go as planned. The expectation from Tal and Steve was, learn from your mistakes, and don't make the same mistake twice. From 1999 to 2003, Tazo ran as a wholly owned subsidiary of Starbucks. Eventually, the idea was born that Tazo should be more fully integrated, and the process began of consolidating or eliminating departments. Steve Smith, like new I think kind of knew that it was the beginning of the end. And our like last week 
was kind of the best week I've ever had professionally. Someone told us to go out into the parking lot. Steve drives up in this ice cream truck and he's got this crazy wig on. Coming around giving everyone like popsicles and you know, it's an ice cream truck. And I'm a big fan of ice cream. Just for us. You know, it was, and it almost made it harder to go because you're like, God, this is awesome. This is a great place. By 2011, only manufacturing, supply chain, tea purchasing, and accounting were left. We all felt like if we could just get the larger organization to see how hard we worked and what a great job we did, they would keep us in Portland. But in November of 2011, the decision came down to move the Portland plant to Seattle. I think it's a crying shame they're pulling this company out of Portland. I really do. I understand the logistics behind it. You know, it's, it's a business decision. But over and all, I think it's a crappy decision. When they moved the building, when they decided to move from Portland to Seattle, they lost people. They never got that people were why the thing was so great to begin with. It's people first before, you know, the, the job. It's, you, you have some places where it's job first, people second. But, and I'm going from just my personal experience, people first, then job second, you know, because if you take care of your people, you know, then, then, then they're willing to, to sacrifice and do the things they need to do. The machines and the equipment are moving up there, but Tazo is us, is this yeah. group of people working together. And once we're no longer working together, Tazo will just be that brand. When you're working a full-time job, it's, you know, it's 50% of your life. And when you can't really get along with people or don't like the environment or don't like what you create, um, it's a lot of time to not be happy. <laughs> so it's a lot of time out of your life to not be happy. I think Tazo made people better. I mean, I'll be interested to hear other people's perspectives, but I think that just being a part of that group would have to make you better. The hardest job you will ever have is your first job after Tazo. I'm going to miss all the great people I got to work with and, and hope the next place I'm at is, you know, just got even a little bit of what we had here and I'll be happy. Uh, and then in your second job after that, that's when you say, okay, how can I, I might not have the whole, all the pieces and parts that we, we had to make Taza what it was, but what can I bring to this organization to strive to get as much of that as possible? Taza will be no more, but it'll still be. Good times. If I brought Cheers. my drink over, I would. I would we had a good run of it. 18 years. So, what was the secret? What did we discover in our quest? There was a, uh, uh, either an earthquake or a significant low tide, and it uncovered an ancient cave. And from that cave, the stone emerged. On the stone were recipes and formulas and the secrets behind Tazo. This discovered artifact that, that sort of holds the key to all of the formulas, and we've only been able to just decipher only just a few. What are the core values? Do you remember? Have fun. No. Uh, fun. I know that was one of them. Were these Tazza core values or Starbucks? Yeah. They weren't the Starbucks ones. No. Well, I didn't think so. I just wanted to be sure. No, 
don't they remember were, those either. Remember Suzanne made them? They were beautiful. They were on a little scroll that she steeped in tea and then rolled up and put in a little container. I don't remember that at all. Sorry. <laughs> you didn't know the values. The core values. Let's see. You're supposed to respect other people and their diversity. You're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to... So this is a test. You're supposed to... Um, no, that's the closest okay. I'm going to get. <laughs> we need to make money. We need to take care of the community, the environment. <clears throat> um, we need to teach each other, treat each other with the respect and dignity. Um, we need to have fun. There were eight. I think I came up with it. That's actually really good. <laughs> Maybe you could run them at the bottom of the screen on like a scroll while we're... We probably will. Okay. Um. All right, so maybe we didn't remember the core values, but we lived them. It starts with an idea. And creative, caring, and humble leaders. Leaders who inspire passion in everyone for the brand and company. Unite people around the idea that we're in this together. Foster innovation throughout the company. Listen to new ideas with an open mind. Require everyone to be great business people. Expect that people treat each other with respect. Encourage people to have fun. Shouldn't all jobs be like this? Bye.